this talk I'm giving today is about this paper uh, called the Tenuous Co-Production of China's Belt and Road Initiative in Brazil and Latin America. It was co-authored with my colleague, uh, Margaret Myers. And this particular paper, um, uh, I'm not necessarily um, going to be discussing too much about the theory uh, or the historical context here. For that, I uh, ask you to take a look at some of my other work. For example, uh, this paper in Journal of Latin American Geography, where I talk about um, theorizing in terms of conjunctural analysis and how Brazil, China, agricultural trade relations were established in terms that set the condition for, chi for Chinese investments now. And this other paper in territory politics governance, where I developed more thoroughly uh, how the theory of assemblages um, enables us to understand how Chinese capital becomes assembled with Brazilian land, labor, and expertise through a, a particular group of technocrats, you know, boosters, brokers, bureaucrats, and businessmen. This is going to be sort of in the background of this paper as I turn to the discussion of um, how uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative is being assembled in Latin America. Um, I also have this a recent paper uh, co-authored with Galen Merton, Ale Ripa, Tyler Harlan, and Yang Yang, where we set out what we think is important in terms of this approach to understanding China's Belt and Road Initiative, looking at it from the ground, looking at it ethnographically, not paying attention just to policy, but looking also, and more importantly, at the whole bundle of discourses, interests, you know, practices that come together to form the Belt and Road Initiative, not as a homogeneous policy from Beijing, but as a contested, fragmented, you know, developing a set of projects, policies, practices, and discourses. And that's what we're trying to show uh, here in this particular paper. It's not so much about how China is expanding the Belt and Road Initiative to Latin America, but really how the Belt and Road Initiative is being co-produced by multiple actors. And this co-production is not only multi-sided involving multiple actors, but it's quite tenuous. So in this paper, we try to show you know, how this is taking place and why it's so tenuous like this. Uh, I want to, um, again, call attention to my co-author. This paper wouldn't really have been possible without the collaboration with Margaret Myers, who's the director of the Asian Latin America program at Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, she's a spectacular policy analyst. She always has her finger on the pulse of China-Latin America relations. And it's been really a great honor to work with her to develop this research paper here. So this is my outline of this particular talk. First, I'm going to situate the Belt and Road Initiative as really a pivot away from Latin America. And that is an important context in order to understand how, who played this role and why Belt and Road, America, Belt and Road Initiative was expanded to you know, encompass Latin America. That's when I'll be talking about the co-production of this initiative. And then I'll talk about the limitations, the challenges, the reasons why it's been so uh, halting and so partial um, as, as a process. And finally, I'm gonna to turn to a case study of Brazil, even though Brazil is not formally part of the Belt and Road Initiative to show exactly you know, how it is that this can, becomes co-produced not only by multiple actors within China and beyond China, within Latin America and beyond, but also how there have multiple converging and diverging interests that sometimes align and sometimes don't. And this contingency is central to how we need to understand the process. So let's begin with the BRI as a pivot away from Latin America. There's no official map of the Belt and Road Initiative, but this one um, is as good as any others. Uh, it shows the <clears throat> overland routes uh, extending from China across uh, Russia, across Central Asia, across Pakistan, across the mountains through Southeast Asia, and also the maritime uh, Silk Road extending from China's coast uh, largely to towards Europe along the Indian Ocean and eastern uh, coast of Africa. What's notably absent from here is the entire American continent. And this 
matters. This is kind of the point. The Belt and Road Initiative emerged as a conjunction of these two initiatives, a land-based and a maritime-based initiative, that were really focused on improving Eurasian connectivity, on deepening the connections between China and the rest of the Asian continent and extending as far west as Europe in the eastern coast of Africa and across Southeast Asia and perhaps into the Pacific. But uh, <clears throat> the fact that Latin America is not included is quite important and quite notable because in 2000 and uh, thir 12, 13, when Xi Jinping came into power and these initiatives started to really be uh, systems, you know, systematized and become what they are now. This was a time in which there was actually pretty substantive uh, growth of investments from China into Latin America. And the characteristic of the Belt and Road Initiative of being very focused on infrastructure, especially on Chinese infrastructure construction and finance for infrastructure is also quite pertinent to the fact that this was a major part of China's investments in Latin America, especially through a lot of its policy bank loans, the China Development Bank in particular, as well as the Exim Bank. You'll notice that before 2010, um, there wasn't that much, but 2010 was a major turning point. Of course, this was after the global financial crisis. This was the moment that the BRICS was institutionalized formally as a group, including you know, um, not only Brazil and China, but also Russia and India. And that was the moment in which Chinese economic development maintained, uh, even while the global north was playing into crisis, largely by deepening trade with other partners across the world, including Latin America, and you know, increasing investment there to continue to supply you know, soy, iron ore uh, from Brazil, oil from um, Venezuela, you know, <clears throat> minerals, copper, of course, from Chile and elsewhere. So this, you know, this launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, in a way it was, it can be somewhat surprising that it, you know, it, it comes without necessarily including Latin America, despite the fact that there had been a lot of such um, investments over time. Now policy bank loans to take just one slice of that, uh, or you know, show also how highly concentrated Chinese economic interests in Latin America have been. Highly concentrated in a few countries. So the top four countries from Venezuela, Brazil, Ecuador, and Argentina have the lion's share of all this capital and even more concentrated in a few sectors, energy above all and infrastructure. So this kind of context, you know, uh, in looking at Brazil, the largest economy in Latin America, the largest uh, trade partner, for China, you see a similar pattern. There was a big boom in investment in 2010. There was an expectation that these relationships would be deepening, expanding. But if you look across the following years, the number, the value, I'm sorry, of Chinese capitals, uh, the value of Chinese investments in Brazil uh, declined quite significantly. It had an uptick uh, towards the 2016-17, but it hasn't continued to grow. So the Belt and Road Initiative actually comes in a moment where Chinese capital has been, you know, was expected to grow in Latin America, but then didn't. As a matter of fact, when Xi Jinping was coming into office in 2012, the Chinese government made an analysis, they made a study, an internal study of all Chinese foreign investments in all countries and in all sectors, and found that something like 60% of them were delayed, hadn't been started, uh, or were losing money, and another, um, 20% or such were um, just breaking even. So it was only a small minority of them that were on time and being profitable. And the decision by the Chinese central government was actually to close the tap on that cheap capital that had been rolled out in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. So while in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, it was very easy for Chinese companies to get loans from Chinese banks, from even the policy uh, banks themselves and make major investments abroad, um, that became much more difficult around exactly the moment that the Belt and Road Initiative was being created and established. And this was very notable in Latin America. Uh, instead, what emerged was the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, 
which emerged in 2016, largely as one of the main instruments to implement the Belt and Road Initiative. Here you see there's two clear uh, divides in terms of its membership. First, this, it's not just a Chinese bank, it's truly a, a multinational uh, bank, but all the, you know, there's the member states uh, who are regional and those considered to be outside the region. It's very clearly focused on, as the name says, infrastructure for Asia itself. Um, and there's also prospective members, um, you know, members that are still, you know, in the process of perhaps joining. Um, and that's where most of Latin America finds itself. Ecuador really is the only country that I think is already a member uh, and French Guiana, which of course is still a colony of France and that's why it's there. So the prospects of this Chinese capital, especially policy bank loans flowing into Latin America was largely also curtailed by a refocusing of these priorities in the Eurasian continent. Um, in 2015, for example, when the National Development Reform Commission, one of China's highest policy making bodies uh, was really defining the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, in its earliest moments, it was talking about it as an open and inclusive initiative, you know, and that welcomes the participation of all the world's countries. Now, it in includes them insofar as they can be bringing capital to these Asian-based projects. This is not necessarily about expanding the Belt and Road Initiative to the whole world as much as inviting the rest of the world to participate in the construction of these infrastructures for Eurasian connectivity. That was quite clear in the AIIB's uh, projects, you know, especially early on in the first uh, two years that it was operating, except for a few projects in Egypt, they were all uh, focused on Asia itself, and interestingly, largely in India. In the meantime, how did China-Latin American relations unfold? They looked quite different. For example, in the first meeting of the China Latin American Forum, 2015, um, there was no mention of the Belt and Road Initiative at all. And this is despite the fact that by 2015, this initiative had already been consolidated as a centerpiece of China's foreign policy. This had already been consolidated in the public discourse about China's international investments and development cooperation. And yet it did not feature in this highest form of China Latin America policy making. How is it then that it's emerged? Things really take a turn, things begin to change, not so much because of Chinese policy making or government or even business interests, but really because of Latin American elites themselves, Latin American business elites and state elites, Latin American governments, officials especially, start to play an active role lobbying for Chinese capital, lobbying for investments. And this was especially necessary in the moment where by the mid uh, 2010s, you begin to have uh, increasingly severe economic crises, shortage of capital, infrastructure construction companies such as in Brazil, which were you know, entering into major crisis because of uh, investigations for corruption and you know, having a huge impact, not only infrastructure construction in Brazil, but across Latin America, where Brazilian companies are some of the major players. And that's where you start to see in those moments, these Latin American players, you know, emphasizing the need or the desire, or sometimes even the fact that the Belt and Road Initiative should or already was there. For example, Bolivia's ambassador said, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is extremely important for Bolivia's future development. Peru's foreign minister said that, you know, this was really essential for China Latin America relations to connect both the Atlantic and the Pacific, speaking to a project um, that I'll discuss further on more about building railroads across Brazil and Peru. Ecuador's ambassador to China in 2016 uh, cited the Belt and Road Initiative with having already boosted Ecuador's trade with, with Asia, even though, uh, Ecuador was not a member of the Belt and Road Initiative at the time, and there was no Belt and Road Initiative projects in the country or even in Latin America at all. Um, similarly, in Chile itself, the ambassador to China uh, praised the, the BRI, uh, praised it as a global project and really called for Latin America to join 
uh, in an important meeting in China, a Brazilian government official, even though the Brazilian government at the, at the time was rolling back some of its strategic partnerships with China, still stated that Brazil uh, you know, wishes to actively participate in all aspects of the initiative. In Argentina also, um, you know, the former uh, foreign minister was very much promoting, again, uh, the expansion of Belt and Road Initiative to Latin America and saying that Argentina is willing to participate. So what you see is that there was extensive lobbying, there was an extensive effort from Latin American uh, governments and, and driven also by economic interests in order to make this Eurasian project grow towards Latin America in order to attract capital to it. And by 2017, you start to see a different tone in official Chinese discourse. For example, in the leading group of the Belt and Road Initiative's main documents setting out the, 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 the projects, while they still only identify you know, five routes and you know, they talk about the different sorts of infrastructures um, and priorities of it, now you start to see a different kind of language where even though it remains focused on Eurasian connectivity, the discourse is that there's a quote, initial group of cooperating countries with the emphasis being here on initial and the idea that this is intended to, to continue growing. And that's also the first time that Latin America is featured in any Chinese official documents about the Belt and Road Initiative where uh, the leading group uh, explicitly welcomes the participation of the region in the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, again, this welcoming China, Latin America's participation is still an important key word. It's not necessarily saying that, um, oh, and here's Xi Jinping giving a similar statement at the Belt and Road Forum, the first major uh, forum of the Belt and Road, uh, bringing partners from all over the world. He said, in all countries from Asia, Arab, Asia Europe, Africa, or the Americas being mentioned explicitly by Xi Jinping for the first time in the context of the Belt and Road can be international partners in the initiative. Now this idea that Latin America can be a partner in the initiative or that Latin Americans role is welcomed you know, to participate in the initiative is really echoing the possibility that they could participate through the AIIB. Not necessarily that Chinese capital was going to Latin America because of the Belt and Road Initiative, but more that Latin American countries could actually be co-investors in some of these projects in Asia. And you start to get, you know, some of that nuanced take, uh, for example, in this statement by uh, China's uh, Director General of Relations with Latin America itself, where it's clear that, you know, on the one hand, the current uh, way of participating is just through the IAB, but that there might be a prospect for expanding this type of funding for Latin American countries themselves in the future. And again, you see this kind of, you know, how this was co-produced, even in the fact that in this Belt and Road Forum, you'll see right here in the front, in the white jacket, I imagine you will recognize Michelle Bachelet. She was not originally intended to be there. She was not originally on the guest list that was invited by China, similarly with the president of Argentina they invited themselves, they asked to be invited. So it was, you know, this initial moment was really very much about Latin Americans, especially in top level elites, asking to join, to get involved with the initiative. And everything starts to change there in Santiago, there in Chile, uh, in, the, in the next uh, China CELAC uh, Forum Latin America. That's when finally, after so much lobbying, the Chinese state starts to reciprocate and then more explicitly assert the possibility of including Latin America in the region. Foreign Minister Wang Yi, for example, states for the first time that Latin America is a natural extension of the Maritime Silk Road and an indispensable participant in the initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is actually mentioned 16 times by Wang Yi at that particular moment. And since then, it's beginning with Panama, followed by several other countries, you finally start to have the formal inclusion of Latin American countries in the Belt and Road Initiative, including Chile. But of course, not Brazil with a lot of the political resistance there. So, you know, why does this happen? You know, you can really see clearly why Latin American countries want to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative, looking at the example of Venezuela, where the economic crisis 
even the political crisis associated with it would be threatening the very uh, stability of the regime and the type of capital that could be brought from China, particularly in a moment of sanctions, particularly in a moment of struggle against the United States, it'd be quite possible to use that capital, use those investments you know, to leverage uh, political gains, um, which in some ways have been maintaining still regimes like Maduro's in, in power. But here uh, we can also see some of the reasons why the Chinese government was so hesitant to include Latin America in the region, you know, concerns about overextension and political resistance. So it's not that Belt and Road Initiative is just an imposition from Beijing. It's not just China's foreign policy around the world. Uh, it's also about how Latin American elites have been, you know, lobbying and bringing that in. But again, it's not just these two. When we're talking about co-production, we're looking at partners even with, within and outside the region and people who are not partners. Concerns about, for example, geopolitical competition in the region that made China be very hesitant to name some of these projects that otherwise would have been perfect candidates for Belt and Road as part of that. Uh, and also resistance within the region itself. The social movements, peasants, you know, workers who have been resisting what is perceived to be just another onslaught of foreign capital of transnational corporations against their livelihoods. And, you know, for many of these reasons, you see that even, you know, for example, the China Latin American Cooperation Fund, one of the largest financing instruments for Chinese capital in Latin America, when they did get included in the Belt and Road Initiative, they said, well, this is really just for show. It doesn't make any real difference in terms of Chinese capital for the region. And a lot of this concerns, a lot of these concerns about the overextension of China's Belt and Road Initiative comes from a long history of failed projects in the region. You know, a Chinese backed Panama Canal, uh, I mean, Nicaragua Canal to, to rival the Panama Canal project uh, never got off the ground. Uh, there was high profile negotiation for high speed rail uh, in Mexico that the Chinese companies were really betting on and it failed spectacularly. Similar rail projects in Venezuela have never been built. And in some places like Argentina and Brazil, there's even been active resistance to Chinese uh, farmland investments and otherwise. So there's sense among many Chinese elites that Latin America is too risky, too risky politically in terms of the geopolitics and the local politics of it all. And this notion of risk really has to be unpacked more carefully. The idea of Chinese companies at first was that they wanted to get into Latin America, even if they lost money at first, for example, uh, in 2012, um, when they wanted to you know, get some projects, infrastructure projects for the uh, Olympics and the World Cup, even if they didn't make money at first, they wanted to join that market, um, but they weren't able to, not so much because of you know, limitations from the Brazilian government, but really because of a lot of lack of experience about Chinese companies. You know, this was really clearly a sentiment that Brazilian uh, brokers and business folks had that um, it would be possible for them to make these investments, um, you know, with a long term gain. And the, excuse me, the context of US competition with China globally also set a lot of concern for Chinese companies to for their investments to be perceived as antagonizing the US in quote, its own backyard. And it was quite clear that many, um, that the US government was actively lobbying against that. Uh, Jim Mattis, then Secretary of Defense said, you know, no country should put itself in a position of declaring one belt and one road. Um, well, Rex Tillerson, who was then Secretary of State, you know, was warning Latin America that China's capital and offers always come at a price and accusing it of being imperialistic. There was very clear pressure to position Latin American countries either for or against China in relation to the United States. In this major US government report, for example, um, one of the main points that it really makes is that Chinese capital is not only you know, development assistance for the region, but really taking place in a way that can deepen China, Latin America's over-reliance on raw commodity exports and increase the debt burden in these countries that China could exploit for political leverage. Now, of course, we can talk about a lot of hypocrisy here uh, as well, which doesn't go 
Understood. Gustavo, Gustavo, uh, the, you have a five minutes to go. Thank you. This is perfect. I'll, I'll conclude this five minutes with the case study in Brazil. So Brazil is not a member of the Belt and Road Initiative. The closest that has happened last year was both countries signing an agreement, a bit of a lower level one, just by their vice presidents, that recognized the possible synergies between their investment policies and infrastructure, including the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but even though Brazil is not formally part of the Belt and Road Initiative, I think it is quite important to think about how it plays out there because of you know, the political context, because of a guy like this, Bolsonaro, who was elected very much on an anti-China platform, saying you know, China is not just purchasing from Brazil, they're buying up Brazil itself. These investments leave Brazil in the hands of the Chinese, very much echoing that, that kind of xenophobic discourse emanating from the United States. As I mentioned before, you know, this was a moment when Chinese capital was actually increasing in Brazil, um, but no, nowhere, nowhere near the levels of 2010 as it was before. If you look at the number of projects, they were, you know, have increased a bit, even though the value hasn't uh, so much. And again, very much focused on a few sectors, energy above all, and infrastructure. So <clears throat> the main piece that became uh, uh, part of the debate about what the Belt and Road Initiative might look like in Brazil and across South America, really turn on the Bioceanic uh, Railway, the Transandian Railway from Brazil across the Andes through Peru. Now, Brazil had had a long-term strategy to expand its uh, railways infrastructures. And there was actually a moment in which this particular stretch here, that was the closest that the Chinese infrastructure company came to actually building a railroad in Brazil. Uh, the Brazilian partner, on the other hand, pulled out of the project because they thought they could get more money than was actually being offered by the Chinese government, by, by the Brazilian government. Basically, Camargo Correia, the Brazilian partner, want, you know, gave up on the project because they thought that the Brazilian government was not giving them enough as much as they could get. Even though the Chinese partners, they said, OK, this is not so profitable, but we just want to get it, get it done. We just want to show that we can work in the in the country, get experience with the project, and from there, continue expanding railroad projects. And this was not only about that project that did not come about, it also was a moment where you start to have competition with different projects. So while there is the East-West Transindian Railroad as part of the discourse, there was also a, a project of building an, a new North-South Railroad called Ferro Grão. This grain railway goes from a soybean producing area where a lot of the Chinese interests are to new ports on the Amazon River. And this was the project that was actually being showcased in 2015 when Xi Jinping visited Brazil with a huge uh, group of, of, of business folks. And it was clear that the, that the Chinese actors were not that, you know, feeling so welcomed when this project was being showcased uh, but it was already controlled by U.S. companies in partnership with Brazilian companies. So I said, why do you invite us to look at a project that's really from our competitors? We're not going to participate there. We need to find our own space. And that never really went out. Um, there were Chinese investments, you know, in some ports in the southeast of the country, uh, ports in the north of the country as well, especially by Kafka. And these are the kind of projects that were much more prioritized by the Chinese government. But if you look here, these Chinese owned ports, for example, in the Amazon basin, they're actually connected on this north-south railroad. China's main agribusiness company operating in Brazil has an interest not in the east-west, you know, Transindian road, but on the north-south one. And of course, building the east-west one across the Amazon has terrible social and environmental challenges major technical challenges of building it across the Andes and reduces Peru just to a mere entrepot, just a passage point for Brazilian commodities to export to China. So by 2017, when Li Keqiang visits Brazil and this project is intended to start to come off the ground, the project has no terminal in the East. Peru has pulled out and there's no clear prospect of how it's gonna go in the West. And yet they say the project is viable. But really when, <clears throat> the Chinese uh, Vice Premier Wang Yang is going to Brazil in 2017, says, yeah, we're still interested in, in participating in infrastructure projects in Brazil, including the ones that are your priority, like the Grain Railway and not the East-West one. So different politicians, different Chinese companies 
have interests, have stakes in very different types of projects. The Chinese railway construction company had an interest in the east-west one, while the Chinese agribusiness trading company, Kafko, had an interest in the north-south one. These projects, you know, have then ultimately now been accepted by the Brazilian government, and I'll finish in one minute, Pedro, only in the end where it's on the particular interest of the local Brazilian actors. So this stretch here in red is the only part of that original bioceanic railway proposed by Xi Jinping that still, you know, has, that is moving forward. You know, basically the stretch that would have originally been built by the Chinese company in partnership with Kamago Correa is the one that is actually now coming into construction. And there's plans and projections only basically going to Western Brazil. While the idea of continuing it onwards is, is now abandoned. So what we find, and this is my conclusion, is that there's a convergence and divergence of various interests that form these Belt and Road or Belt and Road type projects, but they're really tenuously co-produced by multiple actors that have their own interests and they're responding to various different pressures. Different Chinese companies, different Chinese politicians, different actors in Brazil and abroad. And we have to pay attention to these multiplicities of interests. We need to be able to understand these divergences as well as these convergences of interests so that we can ask more constructive and better questions. Like should the Belt and Road Initiative focus on infrastructure projects that basically just get natural resources, agricultural mineral resources from Latin America and export them out? Or could we actually rethink a different type of infrastructure that would actually address intra-regional connectivity and social inclusion more directly and not just as a possible outcome of economic growth in general? Could the Belt and Road Initiative be reframed as a discourse that actually places these interests of the marginalized people and the vulnerable people first and foremost, rather than basically attending, you know, the interests of a transnational class of investors, of government officials, while most people are basically displaced or exploited by major infrastructure construction that largely, um, that largely benefits only a few, and that is really about extracting resources rather than connecting the region. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over time. Thank you very much once again, Pedro uh, and, and everyone else at the Center for Asian Studies for inviting me. It's really a great honor uh, to be able to give this talk at Universidad Católica. Uh, I really uh, look forward to our conversation now. Thanks, Maria, for the, uh, for the, uh, the question. The question is uh, if I could uh, comment on the digital Silk Road and if possible on the Chile Oceania Asia cable, well, where some accuse pressure from the US towards Chile. Um, yeah, I, a lot of the discussion about Belt and Road Initiative focuses on you know, hard infrastructure, which of course includes infrastructure for telecommunications. But it's never only about the infrastructure, it's always portrayed as an infrastructure based uh, international development project upon which various different other interests will go along. So why that focus on infrastructure? Because it will facilitate more trade, it will facilitate more investment because it will facilitate also social cultural exchanges too. And in turn, those social cultural exchanges are also required to facilitate even hard infrastructure. It's about understanding that as a bundle of types of projects and priorities. And the digital, uh, or not just the, the, the digital Silk Road here standing in for you know, telecommunications more broadly, where you're gonna have things like uh, submarine cables um, and also the rolling out of 5G infrastructure, which is another key piece of Chinese interest. Um, that it plays a crucial role because these are huge uh, markets and these are also places where the concentration of, of power and of control has been extraordinary. Most submarine cables go through the United States or go through United States controlled networks. If you know, a Latin American government wants to have communication with China and that, and that communication has to go through cables that are under control of US companies, 
the United States government can and does tap those cables directly. So it's impossible. It's not, you know, telecommunications is not just over the air. It literally goes through physical cables in specific places. So being able to build new cables that do not pass through the United States, that do not pass through United States controlled networks is extremely important for privacy and national security for any country that wants to, for example, not have all of its communication tapped by the United States government. Not only government communications, but also financial transactions. If the United States wants to impose financial sanctions on a country, part of the reason it's able to do that is because the financial system is connected and deeply interconnected to Wall Street. So telecommunications can also become a basis for say financial networks that can be structured outside of the United States. The United States is able to impose sanctions on countries and governments, even when their transactions are not involving US banks or even US based banks, because if the financial transaction goes through the United States, that is part of the way in which they can also exercise that kind of power. And of course, in Latin America, where you have you know, Argentina that defied the IMF, you have Venezuela, you have the re-election of the Movimiento del Socialismo in Bolivia, you have many different actors, non-state actors, but even state actors who do have these considerations about sanctions and about security front and center. So these are some of the key geopolitical contestations. It's not just the resources and who controls them, but the communications is really key. And that's why the debate around 5G technology is so important. It's a technology that can be important for the improvement of telecommunications in Latin America and the rest of the world. And it's exactly the cutting edge of competition where countries may go with Chinese technologies and become locked in with Chinese telecommunications services and the geopolitical consequences of that or not. Now, the specific cable that goes from Chile to Asia and Oceania, I don't know too much about it other than that it's one of the most challenging and also most important ones. A cable that goes across the Pacific, that's the longest, most difficult stretch in the world. And that's why Chile's communication largely doesn't go directly across the Pacific. It goes up along the coast and then through the US cables across the Northern Pacific. So that would, that's exactly where Latin America can connect to China without the United States. That's the centrality of that cable. The, the following two questions are, are about the, the co-production side of your paper. Um, Diego uh, talks about, uh, you know, he poses the question about um, if from the Latin American elites, there was an interest uh, to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative, how do you explain that Argentina and Brazil have not signed a memorandum of understanding, no? That's, that's, that's also um, interesting. And, and um, on BRI, right? And, and Francisco, send your personal note um, and from your field research on, on uh, in soil production state in Brazil. What can you say about ra uh, raising anti-China sentiments in Brazil? Is it possible that it's linked to a rejection to Chinese investment or finance? Thank you for the questions, uh, Diego and Francisco. And, and thank you, Pedro, for bringing them together. Um, so first, Argentina did sign a memorandum of understanding with China in 2018, when the president went to, invited himself to that forum. Um, it, Argentina, it, it did not formally enter Argentina as a member of the Belt and Road Initiative, but it, it basically said that China-Argentina relations would be structured under the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative. And what is the power of that language, of that discourse? There are, of course, electoral and other political reasons why a country may or may not want to you know, formally enter the Belt and Road Initiative. But there's also reasons why countries might want to you know, leverage that for their, for their own. So the Brazilian agreement with China that I mentioned in 2019, it doesn't formally enlist Brazil as a member of the Belt and Road Initiative, 
but it says we have our own infrastructure projects. You have yours, which is called Belt and Road Initiative. And what we're gonna do is find the synergies between them. The goal is to try and make it so that diplomatic relations will enable capital flows rather than limit them. Because as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, this is a context in which there's a concern that Chinese capital is going to be diverted away from Latin America. That a country that does not join the initiative is not gonna get the benefit of this kind of infrastructure construction capital and other types of investment and trade benefits. And as a matter of fact, the reason why a lot of these government elites in Latin America have been actively lobbying is because the majority of the national capitalist class in those countries wants that kind of capital. Since the dictatorship in Brazil, they would convince them to say, look, money has no ideology. Literally, as an advisor told the Brazilian dictator at the time, and they said, we have to reestablish relations with China. And they did during the height of the Brazilian military dictatorship, you know, to say, despite political differences, we have strategic economic, you know, interests that are shared. And it's really clear when you get into the high levels of state and, and corporate um, discourse in Brazil, in Latin America, that it, there is no anti-China sentiment at all. That whatever kind of anti-China sentiment exists there, it's used ideologically, rhetorically by certain actors who nonetheless, like it or not, are forced to you know, do deals with China. So Bolsonaro, for example, in Brazil, to, to go to Francisco's question about the anti-China sentiment, he appointed a minister of agriculture who has been very successful at attracting Chinese capital to agribusiness in Brazil. You know, the Brazilian agribusiness sector, which plays a huge role you know, supporting the Bolsonaro's government, is adamant that whatever political differences there are, China is the biggest market, is the fastest growing market, it's a good source of capital, and we need to work with them. That kind of pragmatism is, is taken for granted, basically. And it's really at the, you know, at a, let's say, a more superficial level of public debate and public discourse where different government officials may or may not use you know, anti-China sentiment to leverage different types of political goals. And that's more about the domestic politics. When, when, you know, when an anti-China sentiment is expressed in, in most of Latin America, it's used as a foil as if China is still socialist, which, come on, like it's difficult to take that seriously, as a way to just kind of browbeat, you know, to beat down the, the leftists that are still left in Latin America to say, oh, you know, we have to get rid of those socialists, all socialists, you know? So it's purely ideological. The, and you don't see a rejection of Chinese investments uh, largely because of this ideological reason. A lot of the, and I wrote, uh, there's a paper in, in Globalization that I published in 2018, where I talk about where are, what are the origins and what are the dynamics of anti-Chinese sentiment about resistance to Chinese investments, of Chinese land grabs. You know, you have like leftist social movements like the ones I showed who occupy the Chinese farm. They're not against that because it's a Chinese land grab. They're against that because they're against all global capital. They're against all transnational corporations land grabbing. On the other hand, when you have the Chinese sentiment, anti-Chinese sentiment from landlords, from agribusinesses, they use that kind of anti-China rhetoric uh, but it's not because they don't want Chinese capital. What they want is that they want to put regulations such that that capital is not going to displace them, not outcompete them. So U.S. companies, Brazilian landlords, Brazilian agribusiness companies, they basically wrote the regulations not to forbid Chinese capital, but to force the Chinese capital to have no more than a 49% stake. They always have to have a minority stake so that their capital will strengthen the Brazilian landlords will strengthen Brazilian agribusinesses. So they're not against it. They just want to make sure that they are not competing with it, that that's going to you know, improve their condition. Thank you again very much. Um, and thank you all for coming too.